Hey guys, welcome back to Coach Hall Writes. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the stable wording for the AP Lang prompts starting in 2020. So basically what this means is that in years past, the College Board has used a variety of different phrases in their prompts. And in order to create more continuity, they have decided to streamline the phrasing a little bit. So many of the phrases are not actually new to AP Lang, but it does help teachers and students to know the stable wording in order to prepare for the exam. So let's see what they're actually going to be using for this year's test. Let's go ahead and start talking about question one, the synthesis essay. So for those of you who might not be familiar with the synthesis essay, basically the college board gives students multiple sources and you need to cite at least three sources in your essay. So let's look at what students actually are provided with. This part is not necessarily new. The prompt is going to contain a, basically like a subject introduction. It's gonna be the context of the issue. And so the wording is going to vary from prompt to prompt because the topic of the prompt is going to change change. So that's to be expected. They've done this in previous years, so this is not necessarily new, but they need to give students a general idea of what the issue is and the different perspectives on that issue. The instructions for the task itself have not changed very much at all. So for instance, students are still going to be directed to read the different sources and also the additional information provided with each source. So if you've seen a synthesis essay, you might have noticed that above the source is a box and it tells you the publication information. That's still going to be provided to students and also usually above the source is a sentence or some kind of italicized portion that gives students a little bit of context if needed. And so students are to read this to help the source make sense. And so that's going to be part of the instructions as well. That has not changed. I've already mentioned that students need to cite three different sources in their essay, but I want to clarify what this means because sometimes students misunderstand this. And so basically three different sources means that you have to cite three separate sources. And so if you cite the same source more than once, that counts as multiple citations of that source, but it does not count as a different source. So for instance, if you cite source A twice and then cite source B and that's it, you've only cited two sources. So just keep that in mind. But the thing that interests me the most here is the word develops. You have to develop a position on the issue at hand. And I think that's a key thing to remember because they're looking for developed thoughts and actually an argument. You have to remember that a synthesis essay is basically an argument with sources. It's kind of like a mini research paper, but they've done the research for you. Another thing to remember is that developing a position does not mean summarizing the sources. Summarizing the sources is just restating information given to you. It's not actually creating an argument. Students are also going to be directed to write a defensible thesis. This accounts for one of the possible six points that students can earn for the synthesis essay. Students are also going to be reminded to explain how their evidence creates a line of reasoning. So to me, this means commentary. Remember that based on the new rubric, students are eligible for up to four points in evidence and commentary. So a strong essay that is developing a position is going to have multiple claims, and those claims are going to be supported by evidence and commentary that relates back to the thesis. The final bullet point, if you will, as far as the stable wording for the synthesis prompt pertains to using appropriate grammar and punctuation. Now, this is going to be part of the stable wording for question two and question three as well, so I'm going to be giving additional tips for this later in the video, but let's talk about the way to write an academic sounding essay. First of all, we want to avoid filler words like really and very. We want Want to avoid cliches and idiomatic expressions. Basically, if it sounds like it came from a fortune cookie, it does not belong in your essay. We also want to make sure that we're not just sprinkling in sophisticated words for the sake of trying to sound sophisticated because that's not how the sophistication point works. Oftentimes when students include elevated vocabulary just to try to sound more impressive, it actually backfires because they misuse the word. Now let's talk about the stable wording for question two, the rhetorical and analysis essay. So for this part of the exam, students are given a passage that they are to read and analyze. I highly recommend that students annotate as they read. And this passage can be anything from a speech to a letter to an essay or article. 
They've even done satire in the past. It's been a little while, but they have done it. And so one thing that students need to remember is that they're going to be presented with the rhetorical situation. This is part of the stable wording, but it's not necessarily something new. They've always given students this. One thing I like about the College Board prompts is that they give students all the information they need to know to be successful to interpret this passage. This includes providing students with the full name of the speaker, the birth and death dates of that speaker if that's relevant. They give the students the year of the speech or the year of publication. They tell the students to whom the letter was written or to whom the speech was given. All of this is given to students and they give extra context as far as in the case of the most recent prompt in 2019, Gandhi's letter to Lord Irwin, they told students exactly when India gained its independence. They told students who Lord Irwin was. And so students are gonna be given the rhetorical situation in the prompt, but they need to analyze the impact of the choices on that rhetorical situation. One of the things that I found interesting is that the College Board said the passages are going to be approximately 600 to 800 words in length. And one of the reasons why I found this interesting is because the passages are generally in two columns. Usually it's a page, though sometimes it goes onto a second page. And so now we have a general word limit that we can keep in mind. The phrasing that is going to be used in the stable wording for the prompt of question two is not necessarily new, but what I like about it is that we now have a consistent way to phrase these prompts. So one thing you'll notice is that they're using the word rhetorical choices, not rhetorical strategies. Also, in terms of how to finish the rest of the prompt, there are now three options because in years past, they sometimes threw in other phrases like with the original Gandhi prompt, it said, how does he present his case? So here you have the three options that students could be presented with. This makes it a lot easier for students to prepare because they know the three different ways that the essay question could be phrased, making it easier for students to understand the expectations. Given that evidence and commentary make up four points of the rubric, it should come as no surprise that students will be directed to include evidence from the passage. This evidence can be in the form of a paraphrase or a direct quotation. It does not say, however, that students need to actually cite the passage in terms of a paragraph number or a line number. Even though citations aren't directly mentioned in the rubric as they are with question one, some students do like to cite the actual line number and that's absolutely okay. One thing I would keep in mind here with the wording is that it says select and use evidence. So we wanna make sure that we're selecting appropriate evidence. We don't want really long quotes and we wanna make sure that the evidence we're selecting has meaning to our argument. As with question one, students are going to be directed to explain how their evidence supports their line of reasoning. One thing to keep in mind is that you don't want to analyze only only one portion of the passage given. You want to make sure that your analysis spans the entire passage. So only focusing on the beginning or the end of the passage in your essay is going to be detrimental to your score. You want to make sure that you're examining the passage as a whole, focusing on the beginning, middle, and end, looking at how the author develops his or her argument, conveys his or her message, or achieves his or her purpose. I'm going to venture to say that most AP Lang students have either heard of soapstone or Space Cat. Both of those are acronyms to help you understand the rhetorical situation. So if you know those acronyms, it doesn't matter which one you like, because quite frankly, in my opinion, they equate to the same thing. You need to keep those elements in mind as you are analyzing how an author uses a particular choice. And the reason why is oftentimes students correctly identify a choice. They choose appropriate evidence, but they lack commentary. My own students tend to ignore the audience and the occasion. Those are the two that I tend to harp on the most. Why this choice for this audience on this occasion, especially if it is a letter or a speech. And so you need to keep in mind that your job, especially in your commentary, is to analyze the rhetorical situation. In regard to punctuation, if you have time to go back and proofread, go back and check for missing commas. This is something that can actually help the readability of your essay. Last but not least is question three, the argument essay. So let's talk about the stable wording for this prompt. So one thing you're going to recognize about question three is that there's going to be a quote. And so the quote itself is going to give you a general issue that you're going to be writing about. The task part of the prompt is going to ask students to assert a position on, and then whatever the author's last name is, so-and-so's position that, and then they're going to kind of paraphrase the quote. So students do not actually need to reference the quote. They don't even actually need to reference the person who said the quote, because keep in mind, 
mind. The idea here is to present your own argument. So definitely do not waste time rewriting the quote. The idea here is to put forth your own position. So in years past, they used to say, challenge, qualify, or defend. Now, if you do those things, you are asserting a position. So if you're looking at old prompts, it's okay to use them. Just keep in mind that the wording is now different. Students will need to have a defensible thesis. For most students, this is going to be a closed thesis where students answer what and why. The stable wording for this task indicates that students need to have evidence to support their line of reasoning. So a line of reasoning is basically a logical and coherent argument. And according to the rubrics, in order for students to achieve a three or a four in evidence and commentary for Q3, they need to have specific evidence. So keep in mind that for question three, you as the student writer are choosing your own evidence. And so it's very important that you choose that evidence wisely because you want to make sure that you're able to give specifics of the situation. If you generalize, it's going to impact your evidence and commentary score. As we saw with the other two prompts, the stable wording indicates that students are to explain how the evidence supports their line of reasoning and so basically, this indicates that students are to have commentary. More specifically, they are to develop their commentary to make sure it relates back to their thesis. And as you might have guessed, the stable wording for Q3 includes another reminder about appropriate grammar and punctuation. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you like this kind of content, please give the video a thumbs up. Make sure you are subscribed to the channel with notifications turned on because as we approach the 2020 AP Lang exam, I am going to be releasing more videos as part of a cram for the exam series where I give you guys all of my best tips to help you get the highest score possible and I would hate for you guys to miss it. So until next time guys, happy writing!